All right, welcome back class. This time we have John Sakari, Big Fat Panda joining us again. Um, it was about this time last year that he talked to us the first time. Um, we were in the midst of the lockdown, um, kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel as far as Disney parks starting to open back up, especially in Florida and some of the international parks. Um, and so this time I wanted to bring John back. And I feel like I'm, I'm always looking for reasons to bring John back just so, so we can mm. talk to him. Um, but I wanted to bring him back and kind of go over this, his observations of this last year, how the company handled the pandemic um, and how the, the way that they handled the pandemic really helped fans and consumers and people cope with this really, really horrible thing that was going on or is going on and kind of navigating through that and, and providing that kind of that, that shining light or that bit of positivity. Um, so I've spoken too much. I want to welcome John back to class and, and, and the podcast. And John, if you could um, briefly introduce yourself again, introduce us to where your fandom comes from, what caused you to move to the area and, and where you are now. Thank you. First off, let me say, thank you for having me back. Uh, some of the students wrote some things about the last time I was here. Let me tell you, I read all of them. It was really great. That made me feel like a hero. So thank you. And I'm not. Uh, basically, I was like five years old growing up in Long Island, New York. Very, very, we didn't go on vacation. So I don't want to say we were poor, but we were kind of like moderate, low middle class. And we went to a zoo. That was the most we ever did. So at like six years old, I think it was either five or six, we went to Disney. I told my father, I'm going to move there one day. He's like, nah, you'll see, you'll grow out of it. Never grew out of it. I didn't go back till I was 15. When I was like, I think it was 29 or 30, I had the opportunity to move a business and live in Florida. I was like, yeah, I'm going. So I was a Disney nut. I still am. I mean, it, it kind of... I hate to say that it determines my day, but I like wake up and sleep with something Disney in my head. What park do I want to go to next? Uh, what picture or artwork do I want to put up in my home or behind me? Stuff like that. So I'm a Disney nut and I love the attractions more than the movies, which I love still, but I love the attractions. So that's where my craziness comes from. And the, you, your, your Disney fandom has led to now um, bigfatpanda.com, which uh, you talked to us about last time, but is this really, really great kind of social media and video content that people can watch. Um, and something really cool we talked to, I didn't know, but from last time we talked about um, how people on the spectrum really, really appreciated that. And it helped um, them kind of prepare for um, going on attractions and everything. So, so I wanted to, I wanted to get that out there again, because that's something really beautiful. I think that, that came and it's from something I didn't, that. And as you know, it's something I didn't plan for. I didn't, I didn't know about it. Uh, so yeah, bigfatpanda.com comes from Kung Fu Panda, which is DreamWorks, not even Disney. Uh, if you watch the end of that, he tells him you're a big fat panda. He goes, I'm not a big fat panda. I'm the big fat panda. And I was like, yeah, okay. I'm going to take that name. So that's how the .com came. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I would have, I mean, when I started off, everything was attractions, doing videos of attractions, which I actually have to get back into now with 4K and stuff with a better good 60 frames uh, per second camera. But I would show the boarding of the vehicle, the ride, all kinds of different angles, and then the onboarding. And all of a sudden, I was getting messages from uh, parents who said, hey, my child is on the spectrum. They were scared to go on this ride, but they've watched your video over and over, and they know exactly what to expect at every second. And when we went, they went on the ride. I cry about stuff like that because I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, this kid didn't want to go on Splash Mountain, but because of my videos, he, he or she went and loved it. That's, I feel like I did my little part in the world. So I was happy about that. So now I do consciously think of that when I'm doing a video, I try to have it, uh, for lack of a better term, tell a story more because of that. And that's, uh, again, like, that's, that's so great. It's so beautiful that that, that that came from that. And like you said, you, you didn't anticipate it, but a lot of things that happen and, and help others and, and kind of help society in general 
aren't necessarily you don't necessarily set out to do that right you just kind of it just kind of happens and that's that's the great thing of the great nature of everything but um one thing that i i have wondered um for for someone like you um, a content creator who's in the parks and you're doing videos and you're doing sometimes live chats and things in the parks um do is that were you self-conscious when you started doing all of that are you still a little self-conscious how do you get over that like how do people react when you're on a ride or walking up to a ride and you're videoing and you're you're talking about the attraction and everything um two things i was in tv commercials when i was in new york so it's hard for me to be self-conscious i'm usually trying to either make someone laugh or entertain so that came kind of natural i'm very respectful in the parks i won't do one of those live videos where i'm talking over the attraction or even in line being obnoxious and loud. I, I don't like that because I feel like you're disrespecting the parks and the families that are there. So I'm not that person. Uh, I might have a camera on me holding it close like this on an attraction where, but not like this over my head on purpose for the people behind me. So that much I'll do. I'll, I'll sneak sometimes video when they might say you're not allowed. I've done that. Uh, I have done that but nothing that's going to hurt anybody's experience. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So, but I, and I, as far as being self-conscious of other things, um, no, I think more now is people trying to say hi, which is great yeah. while I'm trying to video. And it's like, you're ruining my video, you know, but you can't, you, you know, I don't get like that, but I want to. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, but a little bit. I've, and I definitely had a, a thing where, how are people going to accept this, uh, this whole thing? Yeah. You know, are they going to be happy with what I'm doing? Are they not going to like it? So there's a little self-conscious there where I guess if somebody said your videos, they were horrible, that would make me feel really bad. Yeah. And I, I asked because I went one time uh, a few years ago by myself because I was there for a conference and I went just for one day and I went to the Magic Kingdom at Epcot. And because my two boys weren't with me, I was trying to do videos for them. And I was walking through the parks like I was whispering. I, I listened to it after when I put it all together so they could watch the video and I'm like whispering and I, I'm like, you know, I, I felt very, very self-conscious about like people watching and like Who's people watching man? and yeah. Like what, what is he doing? And, and I'm like, I, I'm making it for my kids. I promise. I, I'm, um, but so as I said, when we talked last year, um, it was about this, it was in June, 2020 when we spoke mm -hmm. last year and we were kind of, it was, a few weeks before, or maybe it was earlier than June 2020, because it was a few weeks before the announcement that um, Disney would be reopening, or I should say the parks in Orlando would be reopening. Um, but one of the international parks had opened. We were kind of starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will, as far as some of the parks opening and what was that going to look like. Um, but last time, we spent a good amount of time talking about what does it mean that the parks are closed? And, and so kind of this broader discussion of what do the parks mean to people when they are open and what does it provide people? This time, I wanted to get into talking about um, now that the parks are open, they've been open for close to a year, where your impressions of how they've done and how the company has done um, but before we do that, I do want to touch on something we also talked about last time, um, your experience during the pandemic, um, parks being closed, and all of a sudden you, have, you find yourself having to pivot a little bit and getting into other projects. So if we could briefly talk about kind of what your experience was both from a fan perspective, but also content provider and kind of your pivot and how that's led into some of the great things you're doing today. Let me also, I don't know if we even, what we said on, I don't remember completely what was all said on the last show. As somebody who goes on the local news here and they call me the theme park expert, which sometimes scares me. Uh, I didn't think the parks were going to close. I mean, the thought of Disney world closing it was like, no, maybe Disneyland, maybe because it's far away from me. So that can happen there, but not here. And then when it happened, we were like, oh, okay, this is really serious. So just so you know, you know, we don't 
we didn't all know. Like nobody mm-hmm. thought Disney World would close. It just seemed re- ridiculous. So when it happened, it's still you know crazy. Uh, my experience with the company, by the way, if I look back, and I can tell you if something's bad, like I can say Disney was horrible at this. And I will tell you the truth. It doesn't hurt me at all. They might write me an email and say, hey, we didn't like that you said that, but they don't mind. I think they handled it really good. I think they were very careful and systematic about, you know, they tried to use the CDC whenever they could to figure out how to do this, what to do this. Me, myself, I definitely had to pivot. I I didn't have access to parks to make content. And I, you know, people would say, well, you have this whole library of stuff. I was like, okay, so we did those virtual Mm -hmm. uh, ride throughs. So we were all depressed. Everybody here in Florida, my friends, uh, a lot of fans were depressed that I don't know if Disney closing was maybe kind of a metaphor for the world. Like, you know, if Disney's closed down, the world is not in in, in a healthy shape right now. And they were all over the world closed down. Like, I remember people would say, do you realize there's no It's a Small World or Haunted Mansion music playing anywhere in the world right now? And it's the first time that that's ever happened. Mm -hmm. And you'd go, oh, I didn't think about that. This is the first time it's it's quiet. So uh, I had to pivot to trying to, I, I thought, and again, I was depressed too. So I had to shut that depression off for me to come on camera and say, hey, even though we can't go to the park, let's watch a video together of us on an attraction and let's make believe we're there. But meanwhile, I also went through my own, you know, I, my first thought was, what am I going to do? I'm not going to make any videos. I'm, you know, I was going to wallow in my sadness. Um, and finally, you break out of that and you start doing things and you realize, okay, I'm not going to do that, you know. Uh, but there was a point where I definitely was not, Un- inconsolable but i was like down really mm-hmm. i was very down I'm, I'm human and uh then from there we went to i think we still did those those virtual things but then i started to do a lot more lo- i used to record all my interviews people used to come to my house uh bob gurr i think came close to my house here and we did a video and i edited it i can't do that now nobody's coming out during the pandemic so i'm like all right let's find out what the stream yard is and I did a lot of live, you know, stream yard stuff. As a matter of fact, I, I never had you. How could I not have you on my show yet? That, How is that I, possible? I don't I don't know. I, I, I think because I, I talked to you, I feel like I've interviewed <laughs> you, but I haven't. So that has to change. That, that uh, would be awesome. Thank you. And then eventually, uh, towards the end here, I pivoted to also doing a trivia. I don't know, maybe deep down inside, I wanted to be a game show host. So I took Disney and trivia. I found some software where you could do it. And we have Panda www.pandatrivia.com which is every other tuesday so and mean. and it is it i will say the the live videos they're they're awesome the trivia in the way that you do it now where you do kind of every other week there's a video there's an interview and then there's trivia and an interview and trivia um that trivia is i've only been able to do it one time just because of the way schedules work out um, but it's, it's so much fun and it's so, it is it stressful. People tell me it's, not, it's it, stressful. I, I remember, I can't remember the particular question, but when it was asked, I knew it and I selected the wrong answer. And as soon as it, I'm like, Oh no. Cause I was like in the, you know, I'm, was it the I trick? Was, I, sometimes I do a trick one because you get better points for answering faster. And I know people just quickly yeah. quick the first one. I sometimes, you know. Well, and that's, that's kind of what it was for me. Like I clicked it and I'm like, Oh no, I know that's wrong right away. Um, but it's so much, it's so much fun to do that. Um, and we, we try to do some trivia in the class as well. So it's, it, it's fun. It's more relaxing being on the the side of the person giving the trivia questions and the person trying to answer the trivia questions. I would, I wouldn't know a lot of them again. Like I say, (laughs) I know park stuff, but you give me some of these movie things. I'm like, I don't know who Aurora asked this question to. So, yeah. And one more thing on um, there, there are two other projects that you have started during the pandemic um, that have, have turned into some really, really cool opportunities uh, and, and things that people can purchase, uh, oh, things that, that you that. you make and um, you sell. Can you talk about that as well? Yeah, I think that, listen, when you become an adult, and like you all are probably, but when you start to have to pay bills, you realize, oh, I have to do something to survive. 
Uh, I never did sewing or embroidery in my life, but I've always looked at the machines, the embroidery machines, and I'm like, oh, I make some cool Disney stuff on there. And there's some copyright things that I have to watch out for and some non, you know, that I can kind of fool around with. It's Disney inspired. I started to make towels and napkins and stuff. And uh, it's just starting with the Haunted Mansion one. The Haunted Mansion wallpaper was not a copyrighted image and people were loving it and buying it. So I got a home business loan and I bought this really cool brother embroidery machine. So yeah, I started to do embroidery and I was like, I don't know how I joke around sometimes that I have an inner Sophia. That's what I call her. She comes out and she embroiders things apparently. Uh, and then I did shirts with the vinyl cutting and I, I, I'm enjoying having a craft room that I never, I did not have a craft room prior to the pandemic. I never thought of doing anything like that. So now I have like the heat press and I'm pressing t-shirts and stuff and I, it's coming out good. It's doing a good thing. Bigfatpanda.com. You can go to the store there. Pins I've been making. So yeah, it does. I mean, it's all, it was all, that was for a financial reason. I needed to, you know, the travel agency that paid a lot of my salary, my yearly salary was not around. They weren't making any money during the pandemic. Nobody was going on vacation. They're back now, actually, but in a you know smaller capacity, but mm -hmm. still it's starting to come back. Yeah. And and I will say um because I've I have some of the the uh, Grogu, I think people still prefer baby Yoda, um towels and, and napkins. And, and I joked with you about the um telling you I, I don't know if you are aware that you make blankets for stuffed animals because that's a, that's what those napkins became for is uh, they were they were blankets to to cover up stuffed animals at night. That's so. a good that's a good marketing thing I need to do. <laughs> so to to transition a little bit to your impressions of the company and how they handled this last. 15 months going on 16 months now and it's definitely by no means over it, it will continue and also I want to make it clear that when we're talking about these things we are very aware of that this is a traumatic thing that has happened and there have been people who have died most a lot of people have been adversely affected. There have been people who have been incredibly adversely infected or er, affected, and so yeah, we want to be aware of that. And yeah, I mean, we have the 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 tragic passing and death rate that we have throughout all of this. Um, now that that was one, another thing that's worth saying. It was uh, I don't know. Again, I'm going to say that it was different for me only because. I had like these 5,000 Facebook followers and I was able to read a lot. And I would go to someone like my sister who maybe had 30 or 40 and she would say, I don't see where people are dying. And I'd be like, I, I do every day. I'm mm -hmm. reading about, you know, somebody who's sick in the hospital and the next week later, you know, he or she's went to heaven and I'm like, oh, and I'm dying. And nobody else is reading this stuff. Like, and they're saying, I don't know if it's real. And I want to be like, no, look, this is my friend on Facebook, you know. So I I saw a lot of that where I don't know if you were seeing that on your timeline. I was noticing what was going on. It was pretty bad. Yeah. And I mean, it's when you see things like that, it's just as I said, it's traumatic for everyone. And it it's there's no comparison to the person that has experienced something yeah, like can. that. Um, but it is it does bring a person down. One of the things that I think Disney has provided since their inception is this idea of diversion that you can kind of take yourself out of your everyday life and you can divert your attention to something that hopefully makes you more joyous or more happy. Um, and so with everything shuts down in March 2020. Um, from that point on, how do you think the company handled the pandemic um, and, and engaging with their consumers, engaging with their fans? Um, let, let's start March, April, and May 2020. Like, how do you, I mean, the parks aren't open. How do you think they handled everything being able to? to reach 
fans. I, do, I remember, and I don't remember the exact month, but I remember Josh Diamaro, the president mm-hmm. now of the Walt Disney World Resort. He did a video where he was in the studios. Do you remember where it was empty? Mm-hmm. And he said, I just wanted you to see it with the music off and we're going to turn the music on. And I was like, I really felt that emotionally. I was like, I'm looking at an empty park with music that's usually filled with happy people. Uh, and so I thought that was nice. Those little special reach out mm-hmm. things like, you know, don't worry, it will be back. Uh, even they as a company had to be completely shocked at how long it was lasting. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if, I don't know that they knew exactly how to handle it also, especially because you figure, okay, the theme park business is gone. All right. They got movies to make money. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. Theaters are gone too. No matter what they did, if it wasn't for Disney plus, I wonder if Disney would have survived. I'm serious. Like, I don't know. I think Disney plus saved them a lot because that was a way to hang on to Disney during the pandemic at home without that avenue that would have been difficult but yeah they started to do a little bit of reach out things and uh, i'm trying to th- i don't even remember when it happened that they started to do that but back to your diversion thing as they slowly opened which I, we're not even technically there yet the uh, you know in this conversation uh, the diversion had to be less because there was the mask, the shield, the temperature taking. So the diversion was there, but certainly not as much because you were reminded on every turn, we're still in a very bad mm-hmm. pandemic. Mm-hmm. And I I think the, like when I remember having, having two young children, um, how important Disney Plus was. When Disney Plus launched in November, 2019, they had me at at the word go um and i i to this day have watched disney plus every day not like sat down and watched a full show or anything but there has been at least a few minutes every day that something is on either in the background while i'm working on something else or um my the the kids have watched it we started family movie nights on Fridays where, you know, that's where that was kind of the special thing at the end of the week, we would get pizza and we would watch that's whatever awesome. new movie was coming out. And so I remember that first weekend that everyone or, or most of the country is being locked down. That's when they re- that's when they pushed Frozen 2 um, on the Disney Plus early. And then that was followed a few weeks later by Onward, which is because of the dynamic of that movie and father and two sons. That's one yeah. of my favorite movies. Me now. too. Loved it. Um, the um, and they they push that onto Disney Plus early. You know they 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 couldn't open movies in theaters, so titles like um, uh, it, it escapes me now. It, it's the the movie about the the young boy that uh, is kind of a sci-fi thriller. I can't remember the name of it now, but they pushed certain Which titles. Um, I'll think of it in just a little bit. I'm sure it's it's escaping me too. I it, I know when you say it, I'm going to go. Oh, they 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 pushed certain titles on um, to Disney Plus. That that kind of to me as someone who we talk about. Disney, not just in this class, but I talk about it in my other classes and my marketing classes and everything is as how well they can cons- engage their consumers. It just seemed like such a great way to engage consumers and keep that bottom line afloat as best they could, because I mean, they blew all of their projections of Disney plus subscribers out of the water in the first six months. Um, and so it, it was, to me, that was really interesting to see like this, this case study and, and how all of this is going on as we push toward, um, when, like when we talked last year and onward to where the parks were starting to open, um, how do you think things were handled? I, I mean, I remember people live stream or watching the live stream of the um either the city of orlando or the county um board meeting where disney announced how they were going to open i was like the most i'm sure that's probably the most popular board meeting people have ever (laughs) have ever watched in that area or anywhere um how do you think the company handled reopening of the parks 
and making sure people were safe, but having as much of that quote unquote magic as they could. Knowing that it's a, it is a money-making business. And I mean, knowing that they have uh, shareholders to, you know, they're beholden to, it really seemed to be handled wholeheartedly wholesome to me in that, hey, we're going to start off with a 15% capacity. I think in the beginning, they might have even been losing money, more money than they were making just to pay the electric and the infrastructure to handle people coming in and hoping that it was safe, you know, following the guidelines. It felt really good to me and it felt cautious. It, it felt like it, they didn't feel like this money hungry you know, conglomerate that technically it is. It didn't feel that way to me. I don't know if you felt the same way from, you know, Tennessee, but that's how it felt here. Like, okay, they're, they're doing the right thing there. They're treating this the right way between the stickers for the distancing, the Advent Health taking your temperature. I mean, again, Universal 2 was doing the same thing. Uh, so it felt cautious and it felt mindful you know, again, it still was a weird experience in the beginning. When you'd go to a restaurant, they wouldn't let you into the restaurant. Mm -hmm. You'd have to order first on your phone. When the food was ready, you could go into the restaurant. And then each table was completely away from another table. Mm -hmm. And the amount of people that I saw cleaning in the park, you think, okay, you know, I'm going to be more conscious of it. I'll see one or two more. No, no, everything was constantly being wiped down and cleaned. So it felt good. I have to say, as somebody who didn't get the vaccine till, you know, maybe five months ago, I guess I got or four months, three months ago, I was petrified of getting COVID. I'm a big guy. I'm more in a high risk category. I know that. And I still went to the parks trusting Disney and I didn't get sick. Mm -hmm. I was around I, and I didn't feel like I was around as many people as when I went to the grocery store. And mm -hmm. I was like this. They're handling it as good as they can. And they were trying to keep the magic up. You'd go into the haunted mansion and you'd bypass the stretching room. It's not about show anymore. You know, the show is thrown out. You're going to miss the stretching room because we're keep trying to keep you alive and not, you know, put everybody together in a room and get you sick. So they did have to do a lot, a lot of changes. The amount of plexiglass, which I really don't know how helpful it was or not, but the amount of plexiglass that was screwed into places that it was never meant to be amazed me. Mm -hmm. on the rides now it's all being taken down so well and i remember i haven't been back to the parks since they've reopened um the last time we went was september 2019 um but i remember just keeping up with everything that was happening and and using disney as an example that look if everyone i'm talking to is saying disney it, they feel safer at Disney than they do other places and here are all these things that I'm reading on a daily basis as far as the precautions um, it was for me on a personal level or individual level and then again from a, a like a, a university instructor or professor level it was this case study in how you handle this unknown Thing that this unknown event that's out there and every day curve balls were being thrown and it, it was it was really really I took comfort in knowing some of the things that they were doing and that obviously includes watching videos of yours watching other videos and, and people like you talking about what's going on and, and how safe things feel um comparatively speaking to what was going on you'd have to imagine based on how it all unfolded that somebody up in a meeting high up said hey listen yes we want to make money we want to do this 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 but if we handle this wrong and we go too quickly and it starts to come out that cast members are getting sick a lot and that i mean i'm sure a few did you know but and that guests are getting sick a lot the ramifications for the business and for our company mm -hmm. are going to be so much worse in the future as to how we're judged and looked at than if we just do it right and, and just try to survive and bite the bullet right now. Because they did, again, they seem to have handled it in the most wholesome way that they possibly could have. And that's how it feels also to me, you know, and to most guests. I don't think anybody complained about how Disney was handling things. Yeah. 
and and it it does you know the the last time uh and off camera offline we've talked also about um that the amount of trust that a company like disney has that is one of the main things that leads to repeat consumption and loyalty and people always wanting to go to disney people moving to be close to the parks right that that level of trust is is what allows everything else like that to happen um and yeah you break that trust and you don't know what's going to happen you break that trust and all of a sudden people are more um resistant or reticent to kind of yep. what's coming in the future and what the company would do in the future and so yeah i agree from from my vantage point um a long ways away it seemed like things were being handled as best they could and as with many things it was one step at a time and and seeing what worked seeing what didn't work um and then how you know what's the next thing that can be done what's the next thing that we can be done how can we do this while keeping everyone safe but also keeping everyone entertained as well um so specifically about the rides because a, a lot of people um, were not able to go to the parks during this time um, there was plexiglass many many places i know they weren't seating people in in consecutive cars sometimes they were skipping two cars early on um the wait times what did that do to wait times i know it was a decreased the capacity but also when you're you're not seating as many people what did that do in the beginning we all thought because it was going to be you know the park at 15 percent capacity the wait times are going to be so small and they for the very beginning they were pretty good it quickly as the park did get to to their goal capacity felt like wow why is the wait time so long and that was because of the six foot distancing and you know a car or a boat that takes 30 people is now taking seven people or 10 people so it did seem like you know we weren't just hey let's walk on the ride it was we were still waiting and i remember to some of us we would say my gosh that line looks so long sure because you know it used to be this many people mm -hmm. now it's this many people whatever uh trying to make a <laughs> an analogy of that but you know what i mean so yeah it, it did seem and uh what's funny is if you took a, a photo of a line from the back of the line yeah. this is all the the way it looked it looked like such a long line yeah. but then if you went from the side you'd say okay a person here a person there a person there so uh, it's all perspective but uh yeah so it 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 did seem like it was starting to feel more crowded as even with very little people and people would be like oh they're at 100 percent capacity not at 15 percent." no it was at 15 percent, but because of the distancing it looked a lot yeah and i remember seeing pictures of from that someone would take from the back like they would hold up their camera above and it looks like then like the caption would be like oh there's no social distancing here and it's like well yeah. here's a side picture that actually shows the reality. i remember that that was like crazy yeah yeah and um but Aside from, you know, some of the show was taken away. How did it feel just being able to be in a Disney park again? In the beginning, it did feel strange without the entertainment. And I'll explain that in a second because it's starting to come back, but it still feels like you, Main Street used to be alive with the uh, citizens of Main Street. We weren't getting that and we knew it. The cavalcades helped. Those were these you know, pop up all of a sudden without people gathering uh, one float coming through with characters. And it was like, oh my God, something, you know, felt normal. I broke down at one point, not in the very beginning, which was like the Halloween time, uh, October last year. Is it the year before? I'm all confused. It was December is when it started to feel more normal to me. In December, instead of one float, they were doing two or three. Okay. For the first Halloween after the pandemic, the decorations were like, one fourth of what they usually have there were no pumpkins on main street like they usually have in the window so so mm -hmm. it felt like okay this was you know so when they said christmas they were gonna do the same thing i really expected less christmas they went further and they decked it all out so i walk into the magic kingdom and there's like two or three floats now of the christmas parade coming down and i just break down and cry in the middle of main street like a baby people watched me do it 
And I'm like, I just can't believe it feels a little more normal, you know, and, and the decorations were all decked out. And I was like, okay, it's starting to come back. Uh, and even this year, Halloween is still not Mickey's mm -hmm. not so scary Halloween party. It's boobash. Hopefully Christmas, we maybe get completely normal. I don't know, depending upon numbers, which are going down still here. So uh, yeah, it, uh, it took time, but it, uh, it's, it's slowly in the beginning. The entertainment really, I think is a lifeblood uh, pulsating through mm -hmm. the veins of main street and the whole park. I do want the live entertainment to come back, yeah. but it felt good to be back, but you knew, you knew it was different. You did. Yeah. yeah. Did aside from the, the different wait times and the protocols they had in place for like, walking through the the stretching room at the Honda Mansion, not being able to stop in there. Um, did did it feel different on any of the rides themselves? Once you got in the car, everything same, things feel a little different? No, like, yeah, when you're in the Haunted Mansion on the Doom Buggy, you're not looking at, is, is the car in front of me occupied or not? Mm -hmm. And of course the animatronics didn't care what was going on. So no, it felt like exactly the same. Okay. Same thing on something like it's a small world, except for the boat that you could see being a little empty. No, the attractions were pretty much the same. Uh, Tiki Room, I'm just going through in my mind was the same. Epcot, when it did open, same. Every All the attractions pretty much felt the same. Uh, some of them felt cleaned up because they might have actually done something to clean mm -hmm. them up while the pandemic was going on. So some of them felt a little refreshed. Yeah. But for that and moment, it, you could forget about the, uh, you could forget about the pandemic. Well, and that's what I was going to say is like that, that is then that moment where for that three or four minutes or space mountain, I mean, sorry, spaceship earth, 10 minutes that yep. you're kind of like, okay, I can think about what's in front of me. I can set aside other things that are going on this, this horrible thing that we don't really know what's going to happen and um, how we're trying to navigate it. Um, so it must have yeah. been a really, really great. That was feeling. Yeah. yeah. Unless it was on something like Rise of the Resistance with the plexiglass in front of you, you can do that. Yeah, you could completely forget that it was a, a bad time. Yeah. Do how do you think this um how do you think this changed people who people's experience who don't live in the area who don't get to go as regularly? Um, did you talk to anybody about that, or what are your kind of perceptions on how their experiences would change? I, I think the biggest change, and we didn't even touch on it, came from the new reservation system, mm -hmm. and people were planning vacations but not sure they have a hotel, but they're not sure if they can get a reservation to get into the park. How do you spend $400, $500 a night on a hotel? Mm -hmm. And you don't know if you can get into the park. Also that reservation system was a big deal because Disney was, you show up when you want to go, there's no reservation to get yeah. into the park. Now you have that system that you have to even, t how do you tell all these pass holders that are so used to going like me as we want? No, you have to plan your day now. So that's a scary change. And that, that is, is definitely different for a lot of people. But there's a lot of positives in that too. It used to be that if people went to the park and, the, and Disney saw it's supposed to close at nine, but they are so busy, they could make an announcement and say, hey, we're going to stay open until 11 because it was financially feasible to stay open later than to close. And they, you know, as long as they had the cast to cover it. But now they will know ahead of time. We know we have this much mm -hmm. crowd coming. So, uh, you know, I'm surprised Universal did not do that. And I'm seeing the negative of that now, that the, the overflow that can't get into Disney is going to Universal and they're getting inundated with guests that they didn't expect and they cannot handle it. You're waiting online for an hour and a half for a mm -hmm. bottle of water because, uh, you know, they just can't stay. They have to get ramp up staffing now. So that I think is the most thing, even for somebody outside of, of living here, that is the most different is, oh, now we have to plan everything ahead of time. Yeah. Other than that, I think it's just being, a, you know, watching what's going on to see when you feel safe. Mm -hmm. I think to somebody now outside, it seems pretty normal and it should, it, it feels normal now. It does feel pretty normal. Okay. And so then that, because that is, that is something that I, I, wanted to touch on was the park reservation system um that this idea that yeah you can't just drop any more 
you plan out your day, which I think a lot of people who don't go as regularly, they kind of, in a way, are forced to do that because if you have four days, you have four day tickets. Like the last time we went, um, I we bought a four day ticket and you had to go to each park. So you okay. couldn't use one ticket for two, uh, the same park two days in a row. So we kind of were, you know, in a way forced into deciding, okay, here's what we're going to do this day, this day, this day. And then we're going to have an off day to let everybody rest and things like that. Um, but do you see the park reservation system? Do you think that is an overall positive? And do you think it will, I know it's, it's around for the foreseeable future right now. Do you think it will be around for good or eventually it is going to go away? And that includes now being able to park cop after 1 p.m. if you have the, the that option. I think it's good for Disney. I don't think it's good for the guest. Uh, although I think it may wind up being good for the guest if Disney uh, can plan things around it. I do think it's probably here for good. I don't want to say that because I don't want it to be. I liked, hey, you want to go to Epcot tonight and have mm -hmm. dinner and you just walk in and go to find a restaurant that's available and have a dinner. You can't do that now. So I don't like it for me. Uh, I do think it's probably positive for Disney. It's probably staying around now that it's here. It allows them to know what to do. See something like the, uh, the 50th anniversary, uh, Magic Kingdom booked up October 1st. Mm -hmm. Surprise. Uh, whereas now they don't have to just tell the cars trying to park, hey, go to another park, we're done. Yeah. They already know it online. And they're trying to, to now make the other parks enticeable for that day. Yeah. So Ratatouille, which probably could open prior to October 1st, is opening on October 1st. Okay. So you got a reason now to, for people to say, hey, it's okay we didn't get Magic Kingdom. Let's go to Epcot. We're going to get a new ride. Now you have uh, Harmonia starting at Epcot also. Now you have a new show, a daytime show, Kite Tail, starting at Animal Kingdom. Again, not the biggest deal, but you could say, all right, at least we get to do so. so they're, yeah. they're spreading the love and they can do it better because of this reservation system, you know, to not disappoint anyone. Otherwise, October 1st, to get into the Magic Kingdom that morning would, it would be crazy. <laughs> yeah. do you, so and <laughs> on, on that topic, um, for people who, you know, people who don't live in the area, they a lot of people are on planning sites looking at, hey, what's the best time to go to Disney? The last few times I've been, I've used those sites as far as here's when the crowd levels are the lowest. Um, something like this. How do you think the parks reopening? How do you think it affects that type of planning for people? I mean, are we looking at, is it going to be two or three years before we can really kind of project what is the times to go to the park when the crowd levels are lowest again? Or what do you think? Yeah, I think the desirable times to go are probably going to stay the same. Like okay. my sister is a bunch of teachers. Mm -hmm. They always have the same time off usually. And that'll be the week that, you know, is more desirable to go. Hopefully Disney can add uh, reservation spots to that week or that time. So I don't think that's going to change too much, but I think we might see a difference in population uh i should say of of the parks in what the reservation system allows meaning they can dictate it maybe like what am i trying i'm trying to say it but it's not coming out right like if they funnel people to another place because something else will we say oh that's more desirable but was it really or was it just what people went to yeah. because they couldn't get the other so it really depends on, uh, but I, it's definitely going to take a while to figure it all out. I think. Yeah, yeah. And are um, the uh, are the parks at one hundred percent capacity now? Have you? What's the latest? I, I don't part? know if they've officially said it, but it now it feels that way to okay. me. It really does. Okay. Uh, a Universal feels like one hundred and fifty percent capacity to me, okay. and I think that's because they're getting whoever can't get into Disney for the reservations are going there. And I don't think they're, it feels like their staffing to me is at 30%, but the crowds are at 120%. So I don't know. I mean, just I've, I've been here for now 13 years and I've gone to Universal a lot. I enjoy it. Uh, you know, some people will joke around and say, you're cheating on Disney, John, when you go to Universal. <laughs> uh, but I've never seen it where I, it's two hours to get to the parking lot from the, from the, uh, the highway.
and, and, and to get a bottle of water and to eat something in there for I mean, it's almost like just bring a bring a package of doritos yeah. you're not getting service at a at a kiosk and what's so I, i'm glad you mentioned that because it's it's something that from from afar i think is really difficult for people to understand that <clears throat> once the park started reopening excuse me they you saw Universal go first. It was um, Universal and SeaWorld were kind of neck and neck as far as what they were doing at the same time. And then Disney would lag behind a few weeks. And I remember thinking it's because Disney kind of wants to see and they want to see what the market's doing and you you track what your competitors are doing and things like that. And, um, but, you know, and you would see all of these posts and people talking about, well, Universal is so crowded. They're doing great. Like, look at the business they're doing. What's Disney doing? Like, is is interest in Disney down and everything? So I'm glad you brought that up that, you know, you're- Exactly what you're saying. Somebody during a news uh, segment said to me, it's funny seeing Disney being a follower. I was like, by Disney being a follower in this situation, they're being a leader. Mm -hmm because they're saying, let's watch and see how this is handled, what the ramifications are. We're not gonna get the complaints because we're not open and then let's do it right. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. So, you know, I don't see them as a follower. I see it as smart. <clears throat> this has never happened before. We don't have a chart that tells us how to mm -hmm. handle this. Let's, let's watch and don't rush into it. Let's not rush into it and do anything dangerous. I don't know, yeah. I, think, I think they did the right thing. And this is- and smart. For me, this is the first time I've heard the long lines at Universal and not being able to get the service that maybe is expected when you go to a, a park. Um, hearing that for someone like me and hopefully others drives home the point that, okay, here the strategy, not necessarily knocking what Universal did, but the strategy that Disney chose is what what is working for them because as they slowly start to bring back cast members and i know they've brought back a lot now but there's still a lot that haven't come back um they're able to slowly scale things up from a cast member perspective an amenities perspective and a guest perspective um so i i'm glad you brought that up that um, even it even drives that point home even cleanliness you can see at Universal right now until they staff up is not going well. So I thought I was the only one, like, I was like, why is it two hours to get into the park? So as I'm in a dead stop on the highway and I'm watching the police, like I said, somebody's gotta be pleading with Universal, stop charging for parking. The cars are backed up to, mm -hmm. you know, for four miles. I go to Twitter and I look and I see the complaints. What's going on there? Why are you allowing this? And I'm realizing this is a situation and it's happening again today. They didn't yeah. solve it from yesterday, but yeah, cleanliness, everything. Uh, I think that, oh, and they also sent me a survey the day after I got back from Universal. So I think Universal is aware, yeah. obviously with all the tweets and you can see them responding, sorry, uh, they're, they're aware. They gave me a survey that said, hey, are you aware that there's a reservation system to get into Disney? Almost like they were asking, would you have rathered that mm -hmm. for us? It would take, it's a lot of money to put, to implement that from nothing. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, they might be toying with it now yeah. that they see that they may not be able to handle uh, everybody coming. Yeah. And something like um, to take outside of the, the four major parks, um, what some refer to as the fifth gate, um, Disney Springs. What's been your experience at Disney Springs throughout all of this once they started slowly opening back up through today? They, they use their parking lots as security and temperature checks. You know, they had a whole area where you had to enter twine like they didn't have that set up so they they just retrofitted a parking lot to take care of that i'm sure we'll see a um a dedicated building soon to do that but it's been pretty good i haven't had too many uh waits yesterday i went to disney springs crowded but not to the point of of you know taking away from the enjoyment i did for the first time have to wait to get into world of disney okay. they were just keeping it not so crowded inside i'm not going to say it was socially distant 
but I must have waited five minutes. I saw a, a huge line. They would let in a chunk. Five minutes later, let in another chunk as people left. So it's different, but it feels you know scalable. It feels yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, food service again. We went to Earl of Sandwich. I don't know if you've ever been mm -hmm. there. Uh, they had you mobile order and pick it up. We waited about a half hour for a mobile order at Earl of Sandwich, which was again not the usual, but still not didn't feel bad. Yeah. I mean, one for me, one of my favorite things is just walking around Disney Springs and listening to the background noise <clears throat> and the background music anyway. So when you when you go now that things have because well, I guess we should we should first cover what has changed as far as the protocols that were that are in place now compared to when the parks first opened. Um, like social distancing and stuff is is go ahead. the mask thing the man no, the mask thing is the most the biggest deal i think you remember everybody had to have a mask mm -hmm. they moved quickly on that too where i thought disney was going to last even longer disney was following the cdc guidelines where you need a mask and then when the cdc said if you're fully vaccinated you don't need a mask Disney was not about to police and look for vaccination cards. Mm -hmm. It would have been unfair to ask the cast members to check everybody every minute, every day, and you know, on an honesty system. So it was only like a week or two where Disney said, okay, masks are optional now. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember that was fast. We thought, because Disney said, no, still keep the mask in the beginning after that was said. And I was like, yeah, Disney's doing their own thing. Even though people said, but, but the CDC said, no, Disney said, we're private property. We want you to have the mask. A couple of weeks later, I think Disney realized summertime masks. It is hard. If you're walking around and it's 92 degrees beating on you in Disney Springs, you, you don't like that mask. You're looking to take it off and breathe at some point. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad that went away. That was the big, I think that's the big deal for people to come back to the parks was not needing the mask. You still need it. Well, at, in the beginning, if you remember, you still needed it on the attractions. I think that's gone now too. And I'm not a hundred percent sure. It just changed. I think where it's optional now completely. Okay. You do need it now in Disney on the transportation. Yeah. It could be that next week that gets dropped too. I don't know. So that's a fluid changing thing that keeps changing. But yeah, social distancing now, the stickers are coming down, the plexiglass is coming down, the temperature checks went away. Again, it's all like a blur for me. Was it a couple of months ago? I think maybe a month ago, the temperature checks went away. Okay. And then the and it was there was a point where the cast still had to have the masks on. Now that's also gone too. So it's it's there's not much left of the foundation of the pandemic left. And, and I know like something like the, the Disney college program is back now, thankfully for, for everybody that's enrolled in that. Um, and I, I do know, like I've read, they have where the students are staying, they have people, if it's kind of broken down to, if you're vaccinated, you stay here. If you're unvaccinated, like you're not going to have people that are rooming together if they are vaccinated and one's not vaccinated, things like that. Um, so some of those things are, are still in place, but when you, when you go now, does it feel, you, you mentioned it feeling almost normal. Do you get the same feelings now um, when you go than you did pre-pandemic before anything, anybody ever talked about um, COVID-19 and the pandemic? Close, but not a hundred percent. I think once the entertain the live entertainment is a big part of it. I think, mm -hmm. I think once that comes back, uh, once you can hug a character again, you know, there's still there's an interaction lost there, and I can say to you, hey, yeah, it's great. It's not. There's still something that you mm -hmm. miss. There are some things that are good. Seeing Winnie the Pooh at Epcot running through the garden trying to catch butterflies. There is something special about that. If it wasn't taken away from you can't get near the characters. But that was something where we said, wow, that was, even though they've never done that in the, you know, before the pandemic, now they're doing that. And it was cool to see a character in his own little natural habitat, yeah. even though we didn't have access to him. That was pretty cool. Uh, but there is something to be said about meet and greets, uh, interacting with your favorite character, uh, big long parades. I do miss them. I miss the fireworks, which is coming back July 1st. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. No, there was no big shows. So yeah, it feels close, 
but it's still in the back of my head. Hey, too bad we can't go see Fantasmic right now. Yeah. You know, tonight. And this, do you think people are still, does it still feel a little um, awkward or are people still very careful when they go because of we're not, you know, we're not out of this yet. That type of thing. You know, I, I wish I could tell you that I was more careful. I think I was so scared for so long that as I trusted the vaccination, I got the Moderna two shots and it, I, it's been, you know, when it was a month after the second shot, I went out I said, I got to trust it. I can't be scared anymore. We fall back to our habits so quickly, mm -hmm. so quickly. I, I forgot that there was a pandemic, especially in a Disney park. So no, I won't. Right now, it doesn't feel like, and I haven't gotten sick. So if I haven't gotten sick the first time, the second time, the third time, by the fourth time back, ah, it's like reckless abandon. Now I feel like I must be protected. I really hope I'm right. I hope there's no variants that are getting through that we don't know about. But right now, you, you fall back into your habit pretty quick of yeah. of being forgetting about it. Yeah, yeah. And um, one thing I want to talk about before we we get to some of the rapid fire questions um, and if there's something else that I, that, that I've forgotten. Um, but we've mentioned a few times the character interactions and the character cavalcades. Um, do you think they'll stay around? Because they, I've heard people say they are so, they're so much fun because it's almost like when you would go to the parks in the eighties or nineties when before things before there was a long line to meet characters, you would just see a character out on Main Street or in one of the lands and be able to go up and talk to them. Yeah, there's something great about the sporadic nature mm -hmm. of, oh, there's Jack Skellington, you know, and you didn't expect to see him. Uh, but again, see, for me, I love the big extravaganza 3 p.m. parade that we have to plan for. So I hope that it's not replaced, but added. So okay. I would love them to still have a big parade but it would be great if they kept these cavalcades once every, you know, 15, 20 minutes, have a float go through because there is something to be said about that non-planning surprise. And Hey, did you see it? No, I didn't. Where did you catch it over here? When is it coming back? We well, don't know. There's, yeah. there's that, you know, it's, it, you feel very uh, privileged when it comes to you and you yeah. get it. So yeah, I hope they keep those things. I do, but I still don't want to replace the, the spectacles with it because I think the spectacles are the, the big, you know, when you watch that uh, festival of fantasy parade, it's awesome. Yeah. Do you think something like mobile ordering stays around? I mean, modal, yeah. mobile ordering the way it is now, will that stay around? I think so. I think it'll be get, just get better. I mean, remember they had that before the pandemic, mm -hmm. I would watch people online at the restaurant and I would go up, I would order 10 minutes. It would say ready. I'd pick up my order. I still see the same people. online. Yeah. I'm like, guys, you got to get on the app because this is crazy. So yeah, I, I do th see it staying on. I hope it stays. When, and, and I can attest with the last time we went, we had a total of six people with us. Mobile ordering all the way is amazing. Super. You could be in line. You could say, Hey, we're close to this restaurant. Let's order something. What does everyone want? And then you run with it. And by the time you're off of that, you're, you're able to go pick up the food and, and that my, my it's worry, really, really nice. My worry was being picky with the app. I was like, oh, but I don't want the, the, mm -hmm. the tomato on this thing. Now they have it where you, you have all the selection, no tomato, okay. no ham, you know, so they're, they're getting there. Yeah. And um, do you think uh, this is something that I haven't experienced because I haven't been back to the parks since Rise of the Resistance is open. Do you think the virtual queue stays around for certain attractions, do you think it is expanded for more attractions? I think it's going to be expanded for more attractions. I don't think it'll be like Rise, where it rises in such demand that that's the only way to get on it is that. And you're disappointing people sometimes by they're, they're in the park and they can't get that virtual. I don't I don't see that expanding, but I see them having, you know, regular line and virtual. And I will tell you the fast pass kiosks were just uncovered. Okay. So I don't know what that means, but it sounds like it might be coming back fast pass of some sort. There's also a big rumor that a paid fast pass might mm -hmm. be coming. I don't know. Well, and I, I remember reading pre pandemic about programs where you did have 
essentially you everybody had their three fast passes but you could pay and you would get a certain number of additional fast passes or you would get right. unlimited fast passes at some time because i had an experience where um just because of different things going on um and 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 reservations not being able to be canceled because of system and everything. One time that we went, we got additional fast passes. And so I left thinking if they offer that, and if I have, if it's not an exorbitant amount that I would have to pay for it, that is, that was amazing to be able to have that. Um, And so I, I, for people in the class, people listening that haven't been um, and for, for me, honestly, we should probably step back and can you briefly explain exactly what the virtual queue is also? Yeah, the virtual queue is it's on your app that you get to wait in line without waiting in line. You get to put your, your spot, your hold, hold your spot with rise of the resistance. It's really different though. They give you a time at like one or two o'clock that you have to get into a boarding group for rise of the resistance. And if you're not, it's, it's kind of like, random because if you're quick at 101 you can hit the button and all boarding groups are gone and it doesn't matter how fast you are as to what boarding group you get and you could have boarding groups one through 50 and it could be that the ride goes down for an hour so they never get to 50 even though you're Mm -hmm. in that boarding group it's to me that's I don't know if I was, you know, when I lived in New York, if I went on vacation and I couldn't get on Rise of the Resistance during my vacation, I'd be really sad. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's basically you're getting a time to, you're getting a fast pass return time without waiting in the line or with that, you know, you're getting it on your phone. Yeah. And it's not a known time. They kind of, you get a message on your phone that says when to go back, right? You know, with the virtual one, I haven't used it. I think you're right. I think okay. it tells you, but I thought that they gave you an approximate of the, okay. like okay. between 1.30 and 2.30. I could totally be wrong about that. I could. So then if let's say they bring back fast passes the way that they were, so somebody going on vacation and, and they continue this virtual queue, they even expand it, but they don't make it the only way you can get on an attraction. So if all of that happens, then when someone goes they're, they're looking at, you can book your three fast passes, either 30 days or 60 days in advance, depending if you're staying on the grounds or not. And then once you get to the parks, you would also have this virtual queue that you could try to check into different rides. Is that the way that it would work? Unless you think that we don't know, unless they merge the two, yeah. maybe the fast pass and virtual will just become one thing and you can get your you know, they give you three of these and three of these, and you can get them all on your phone or something. I really don't know. The fact that they were uncovered, though, tells me it's coming back It's in some form or fashion. Yeah. Now, remember, too, the, the fast pass coming back does hurt the regular line a little bit mm-hmm. because now you have people that are, you know, going on to the attraction with their fast pass. The regular line is going to take a little bit longer yeah. to get through. So it's a catch 22. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I so- will be interested to see what they do. So anything, before we get to the rapid fire, um, anything you, any kind of final comments on something you've seen that you think, hey, they did really, really good, a good job with this, or maybe things that you've seen where maybe they had to tweak things along the way. And now, you know, they started out at a place and now the situation's a little bit better because they they found out that's not what consumers want. They made changes. You know, going back to the characters, I like when some of the character, I, again, I, I hope that we have character meet and greets and hugs and all that, but I like what they've done and I hope they keep this stuff. Sometimes when you're leaving, they'll have the characters up on the train mm-hmm. station, different ones from villains to regular ones, interacting, saying goodbye. I like that type of life and I hope that the entertainment comes back. Uh yeah, that's it. Just more character interactions. And I hope the entertainment comes back, Okay. which is the citizens of Main Street, that type yeah. of thing. Yeah. The mayor, that type. So the as I said, I do have rapid fire questions. This These oh, are right. a little bit different. Um, last time we talked about like favorite attraction, favorite food, snack. Um, but these are kind of current coming out of the the. Um, pandemic into our, ah, our right. normal. 
Um, what first, what would you like to see stick around um, in the parks, in the hotels, Disney Springs, whatever? What's one thing you would like to see stick around from all stuff of this? like stuff like cavalcades, things okay. that are things that are not planned, that are sporadic, that just pop up and excite people. Okay. Is there anything that you would like to see or were excited to see go away? I would love the reservation system to go away. Okay. Okay. I, I hate uh, having a family member, you know, hey, can you get into the Magic Kingdom or can I? No, I don't know. I'll try. Oh, no, I can't get it, but I got it. It's just, I don't like it. Yeah. Um, during all of this, um, did you did you have a favorite or maybe two or three top two or three things that you would do to cope with first the parks being closed and then kind of the slow reopening to kind of keep that Disney magic going for you? Definitely watching attraction videos over old ones to feel like, you know, okay, I'm there. Okay. All right. Firework shows. Yeah. Did, did you have, um, did you have a, a favorite thing? to watch on Disney plus that kind of helped bring that magic to you. You know, I don't know why, but the Mandalorian, for some reason, it, I feel like that saved us all from the pandemic. I feel like baby Yoda Grogu saved us all. Oh, yeah. uh, but you know, what's really good. If you haven't watched the Imagineering story, yes. you, you have to, I mean, the whole yeah. thing. The, imagi the Imagineering story it's, and as I said, it's, it's actually required watching for the class. Because awesome. it's, it's when we talk about the parts, um, there are things that I can say about the parks. We might as well go to what the Imagineers have to say about it. And, and it, it's a great, great series. Um, it really is. So then we talked about things you want to see stick around, things that you want to or would be excited to see go away. What would you like to see come back after as we reopen? I cannot wait for fireworks to come back. I can't wait for parades. I can't wait, and this isn't even pandemic related, till a new nighttime parade comes. The Magic Kingdom, I think, and, and they know it's needed. They, they, It is coming at some point. I just don't know when. I want another nighttime electrical yeah. extravaganza to come back. But yeah, Fantasmic, I can't wait till that comes back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the on, on, on an individual level, um, what was kind of your favorite way or a way that stood out to you that Disney helped you navigate through the pandemic? That Disney helped me navigate through the pandemic. It had to be Disney plus it had to be okay. Movies that they kind of gave us remember like frozen Two, like they kind of said like, this mm -hmm. is a gift. I remember feeling they didn't have to do that. They kind of did mm -hmm. give a little, almost like they said, as a company, we want you to see us in a positive light. Here's a gift. Yeah. And it really did feel that way. Like, I was like, all right, that was kind of classy. It didn't feel like a big company. Felt like somebody, somebody did something nice. Yeah. I don't it, know if you felt that with a few other things, even Luca, I can't believe Luca mm -hmm. wasn't 29 bucks on premiere. That was just given. That wasn't meant to be a movie just given. Yeah. It was, uh, it felt very, it felt as organic as it could feel that yeah. you know, here's something that people need. Let's give them this. And thank you for that answer because it reminded me Artemis Fowl was, was the movie. Oh, I was yes. Referencing I, didn't even, early. I didn't even watch that yet. Um, it, it, you know, that was one that was, it was supposed to come out, I think June or July, 2020, yep. they released it straight to, to Disney plus. Um, so then on a, kind of broader level to, to many people or society. How do you think Disney helped society and different people move through the pandemic? I think to the Disney fans, Disney was there for them, period. If somebody wasn't a Disney fan, I don't think that the pandemic helped them too much. I mean, I don't, you know, if you're not seeking out Disney, I don't know that they would have said, hey, Disney had anything to do with it. But for a Disney fan, I think Disney can, people can say Disney was there okay. with Disney Plus, with how they handled the parks, you know, just they brought it yeah. as a company. They were very responsible. OK, well, John, thank you again. As I said, like, I feel like I'm I always wish I could looking be, for I wish I could be there. 
I should yeah. come through the door right now. I'd surprise <laughs> you all, right? I feel like I'm. I feel like I'm always looking for ways to get to get you to to talk to we'll, us. Uh, we will. We'll definitely do it again. I have to have you on. The- before before we go, um, anybody who wants to to follow you, see um, what you're doing on social media, what you're doing with the video content, um, and you know what you're doing with trivia, with um, with the embroidery. How do they do that? Bigfatpanda.com goes to the YouTube channel, goes to the Facebook group. There's a little store on there. Look for the pins and stuff that helps support me. They're like $10, I think $11. So whatever you look at, thank you. I appreciate it. Send me a note. Just say, hi, tell me you watched the, uh, the interview and what you thought. How, how bad was I? How good was I? <laughs> well, thank you so much, John. Thank it's you very much, Cody. So I much fun. Um, have a great rest of your day. You too, man. Thank you. Bye.